Welcome to the EVOS seminar series. Today, we're going to talk about the evolution of multicellularity with the help of Maria Reboleda Gomez. I sometimes think of what I'm doing as a sort of geography of microbes or geography of major transitions. So, what is a major transition? Well, let me draw you a picture. The history of life is marked by major changes that have completely changed what life is and how we think about it. The simplest form of life that we know of is the prokaryotic cell. All the other more complex life forms like cats or even amoebas evolved only after one or several major transitions occurred which allowed simpler life forms to combine into more complicated body plans. Through a process called endosymbiosis, some simpler prokaryotic cells became engulfed by a larger host and evolved into what we now call mitochondria and chloroplasts. The whole symbiotic assemblage evolved into what we call the eukaryotic cell. This is one example of a major transition. Another example is when individual eukaryotic cells started living together so intimately that they became integrated multicellular organisms. And some multicellular organisms, like bees for example, have transitioned again into hives. Prokaryotic cells into the eukaryotic cell, multiple cells into a multicellular organism, multiple multicellular organisms into more complex societies. And each time a major transition has occurred, it's had a radical effect on the space and scale at which life lives. Multicellularity represents one of the biggest changes in size in the fossil record. So if one looks at the fossil record, there's two points where the fossil record changes dramatically in the like average size of organisms. One is when eukaryotes evolve, the other one is when multicellular organisms evolve. This might seem a bit obvious, right? Like, of course when organisms combine their bodies they're gonna get bigger, but it's not just that the organisms come to occupy more space, it's more subtle than that. What happens is that the patterns in space that allow bodies to really work at all need to transform in order for a major transition to evolve. In all these cases, these transitions have often generated new spatial structure and new dynamics. By thinking about these transitions in terms of the ways that they change space, Maria offers a new perspective on the problems of conflict and cooperation that have long been the focus of major transitions research. The story we typically tell is that a major transition happens when evolutionary conditions allow for conflict to be suppressed and cooperation to be advantageous. But what Maria's work shows is that in addition to the absence of conflict, conflict or the presence of cooperation, the way that the organisms are distributed in space can have a dramatic impact on how, or even if, a major transition evolves. It's not that cheating and cooperation don't matter or something like that, it's that we need to look at it and understand it in their geometrical context, in their physical context. There's a simple, simpler constraint that precedes all that, and that that simpler constraint actually affects how likely you are to evolve or not cooperation. So with all that in mind, let's take a look at geometry and see how spatial structure can affect the ways that a multicellular organism might evolve. Imagine you have like a sponge and it's like a circle. The bigger it is, the longer it will take for the liquid to get to the center. And so if you have single cells, immediately the nutrients get into the cell. If you have a multicellular that's bigger and the nutrients take a little bit longer to get all the way in. It boils down to surface area to volume ratio. If you have a tiny sponge like this, the surface area to volume ratio is high, but if you have a large sponge like this, the surface area to volume ratio is low. When the small sponge is soaked in a nutrient broth, the nutrients penetrate to the center very quickly, but when a large sponge is soaked, the nutrients remain on the exterior. This geometric fact has a big impact on the kinds of multicellular forms that can evolve. The cells need to be structured in a particular way. If the cells are all just growing in a big clump like this one, it doesn't matter how cooperative those cells are amongst each other because geometry is always going to prevent resources from being distributed evenly. Distribution matters in terms of access to resources. And these geometric constraints arise at all levels. It's basically the same if we're talking about cooperating microbes or cooperating people. Both have to figure out a way to solve the distribution problems that arise with an increase in scale. The complexity of a city is much more than a small town or something like that. But in order for that to happen, we first need to figure out efficient ways of getting resources and distributing the resources all over. Otherwise, competition is gonna just 
just be harsher. The multicellular organism is, in some ways, a city. A city grows faster, but it requires resources from many places all over the world. You know, if New York City could only consume the resources in New York City, there would be no New York City. Of course, Maria doesn't study New York City, she studies yeasts, but the choice of that organism was very deliberate. Yeasts are small, they replicate quite quickly, and their living conditions are easy to manipulate in the laboratory. But there's one more reason which makes yeast the perfect model organism for studying major transitions, which is that there are yeast ancestors, which were multicellular. While the question of how do you evolve multicellular when you're unicellular is pretty common, during evolution we also have seen changes from multicellular back to single cell. So like actually yeast evolved from a multicellular ancestor. We've actually done experiments going back to multicellular and back to unicellular, back to multicellular and trying to see how each of those steps is affecting the change. So in the distant past, yeast were multicellular, and then they evolved unicellularity. Maria's lab has done artificial selection experiments to evolve a new multicellular strain, which was then selected to revert back to unicellularity. So what this system can show us is not just the conditions which allow a major transition to occur, but also what can derail it. And more specifically, it shows that multicellularity may not always break down just because some sort of free riding evolves to take advantage of the whole. Sometimes the cellular arrangement in space can prevent a whole from developing in the first place. I sometimes think of what I'm doing as a sort of geography of microbes or geography of major transitions. What studying the geography of major transitions means is that we don't just study the organisms and we don't just study the organisms in their environment, but that we study the organisms as they become their environment. The major transitions don't represent times when organisms evolve to occupy more space. They represent times when organisms evolve to make the space that they occupied alive. Hey, thanks for watching. This video is part of a class called the Evo Seminar Series. Hey. Evo's seminar series. Maria gave a lecture for us, a lecture for us last week, and there wasn't really time in this video to go over all the intricate details of her experimental setup. Maria transfers multicellular yeast from an aquatic 3D environment into a plate 2D environment and tracks how this change in space affects their multicellularity. It's super cool stuff. If you want to see that, you can click up there to watch the full lecture, and it'll go into all the glorious details. We've also hosted other lecturers who work with this system in the past, so you can click there there or there to watch some more cool videos about multicellular yeast and you can click there to subscribe for even more and I will see you later. Bye bye!